this is what this discussion about net metering is about. During some days, <clears throat> these homes would have solar panels on top of them, may produce energy beyond their current requirements. And so this idea of net metering is, what do they get to do with that excess power? In the most generous net metering uh, arrangement possible, they can almost, if you will, unwind their bill. So if they're paying 10 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, for every kilowatt hour they put back into the system, they get paid 10 cents. In some states, initially, that was the law. And that's where in the second video you talk about them seeing outdated policies. Other states never had that aggressive a policy. For example, in Texas, it's up to each utility to decide how much they're going to pay you for the money you put back into the grid. What's this discussion about uh, people with, renewal, with these solar panels uh, being subsidized by the other users. Here's the point. If you have an electrical grid to operate, you have to pay for all of that. And the actual power generation is a small chunk of it. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is the cost to generate the electricity may only be two or three cents per kilowatt hour. But you've got to have all the lines and all the distribution system and all the monitoring infrastructure, and that's where that extra price comes from. Let's illustrate it like this. Let's imagine that I could walk into Walmart and I could buy an apple for a dollar. That's just it. One apple, a dollar. And a local farmer comes in and says, hey, Walmart, I have apples uh, to sell to you. And Walmart says, great, we love to do local sourcing when we can. And the, the farmer says, well, here's five apples. I want five dollars. Walmart goes, wait a minute. We charge our customers a dollar for the apple, but we have to have the store. We have to have all the people who work in the store. We have to make a profit. We have to pay the utility bill. So, no, we're only willing to pay you four cents for that apple. And we're going to sell it for a dollar because we have all those other costs we have to cover. That's the concept of net metering because the problem is when... Uh, power companies don't pay basically the same price that you're paying them for the power. The, the cost-benefit trade-off for the individual owner for having the rooftop solar tends to go way down, which is why you don't see uh, rooftop solar in communities where the utilities aren't paying a pretty high price for the power. So this is the first time we're going to see in this discussion the idea of, of subsidies and policy becoming important to what people choose to do. Remember too that there is an investment tax credit, ITC, for solar, as there is for wind. Uh, it's, it's slightly different, but it's the same thing. It's a tax credit. And so in 2015, there was a bill that was negotiated between the Republicans and Democrats and signed by President Obama. And part of what it did is it started to phase out these subsidies because the people are arguing, hey, these technologies are maturing. So you can see that the subsidies are going down. Rooftop solar loses all their federal subsidy in 2022, and the commercial is, is uh, reduced. Now, we've seen that the price of solar has dropped quite a bit, and it should be cost competitive without these sorts of uh, benefits. But as an investor, outside investor who's paying to install these systems, you love these tax credits because that's like guaranteed help on what you're trying to do. So that's solar, and solar is important and it's growing, but the primary uh, source of renewable energy in the United States that is growing is wind. Another chart that shows you the potential for wind. Not surprisingly, the potential for wind is greatest in the heartland of the United States. And so when we start to look at where, so, uh, I'm sorry, wind turbines are installed, you're gonna see it mirrors this. But we have to acknowledge a challenge right up front. What do we talk about uh, when we look at the population distribution in the United States? Where is the United States populated? Heavily along the eastern seaboard and in spots of the western seaboard. What do they call this area that's great for wind? Well, pejoratively, it's nicknamed flyover country, meaning that there's nobody that lives there. This is going to be a problem because it's not easy to move the electricity long distances, and we'll talk about that more later. So this is one of the issues for wind. 
this is why the, the growing movement for offshore wind is so important. And there are companies that are beginning to, I don't want to say they're beginning to build because they're not that far along. They're developing projects off the coast of New York and Massachusetts and those sorts of areas with offshore wind. And why that would be such a significant development is because they are close to a lot of population centers. And that's not electricity that would have to be moved over great distances. But you can see that the United States has a lot of wind resources. Uh, I am not going to play these two videos for you, but I'm going to make sure you have the slides. The video on the upper left is a very good explanation of how a wind turbine works. And so if you're interested in a little bit of what does it really do and how much energy can it generate and how the techno technological improvements they made, that's a great video to watch. The bottom right video is a much shorter video, about two and a half minutes if I recall, and it's fantastic. It shows a wind turbine being uh, constructed from start to finish. And so I really encourage you to click on that when you download the slides because I think you're going to, it's just a fascinating process to watch. It also gives you appreciation of how massive this thing is and how heavy the, uh, the blades and the wind turbine uh, that sit atop that mechanism is. But we're going to keep uh, moving on and I'll let you watch those at your leisure. Just like there was uh, investment tax credits for wind, there are also production tax credits for solar. And the reason uh, that this is so important is, that, I mean, this is big money. So again, 2015 bill that caused this to draw down. In 2017, it was at its peak of 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour. That doesn't sound like much money, but 2.3 cents is like what a lot of these generation sources are getting paid in total. And so this is almost like doubling the profit margin for some of these. But the agreement is, is that these would ramp down. And you see the ramp down uh, in the bottom left part of the chart as to what's happening with wind. And notice that in 2020, it goes theoretically to zero. Now, what happens is they get it for 10 years after it goes into production. When it talks about them being ramped down, that locks in the credit that it gets. I personally believe that when the Obama administration signed the bill in 2015, they did so assuming that there would be a Democratic administration that would take over the White House before the uh, tax credits completely ramped down. So I think this will be one of the first things that you will see taken up in the Biden administration is this idea of extending or bringing back the uh, production tax credits for wind turbines. And you can also see there, the also I also put on that chart, the, the tax credit phase down for the solar um, sources that we looked at in the other chart. This is big money, and we'll talk about this more later. What I want you to see is that Texas is wind central. In the United States. If you, uh, Texas, if it were a country, would have the fifth most wind generating capacity in the world. Texas is the wind capital of the United States. It's not even close. Sum up number two, number three, number four, add them all together, and they still don't equal the wind generating capacity that's in Texas. And that isn't going to change anytime soon. This chart shows you the capacity, the, the, the uh, construction that's ongoing in, uh, this one says 2019, and I'm going to show you a, a little bit later a chart that shows 2020 as well, and Texas just keeps gr getting further and further ahead. Way more construction in Texas than in any other state. That ought to make you ask the question, why is Texas the wind capital of the world? And we'll take that up in the next video.